So I want to talk to you about the sensory diet, which is, um, I think, an, an effective tool for you to use with children who have sensory processing issues. Have you heard of a sensory diet before? Yes. OK, good. All right. So first of all, you know, what is sensory processing? And, and uh, it's the idea of taking in sensory information, organizing it, and then behaving in a way that's in accordance to that input. So it involves you know, registering that there's a sound, orientating to that sound, um, organizing in your brain what you're going to do about it, and then your behaviors. Okay. Um, so we all know we have five sensory systems, and, and we like to talk about seven of them. So touch is one, so the idea that you're sitting on a chair and you, your tactile receptors um, are all sort of firing off. Hearing, so you can hear me uh, and my accent, and you can hear you know, people around you, but you're still able to, to attend to me. Taste, so the food that you had, smell. Remember that taste and smell work together, so a lot of the kids that we um, work with, uh, their smell uh, sensations are oversensitive, so then they're not able to quite eat as much as we would like them to do. Uh, visual, we like to talk a lot about, you know, visual information is processed faster, so we use visuals very often, not because the child doesn't understand um, what it is that you're saying, it's just that the visual information is going to be processed faster. So that's why we say use visuals um, so that, that, that they can respond quicker to you. And then um, we like to talk to, uh, about vestibular, the vestibular system and the proprioceptive system. So we call them the power senses because those are the two senses that we use to try and effect a change in your child so they can better process information. So your, your vestibular system is telling you right now that you are staying still, that you're sitting. Um, it gives you, it tells you whether you're going fast or slow, whether you're upside down, which a lot of the kids like to be upside down, or whether you're standing upright. And of course, your vestibular system is very much linked up to your proprioceptive system in that they work together to maintain your muscle tone, and also your vestibular system works so that your ocular motor control, so your eye. So um, it's all working together. And then your proprioceptive system, have you, have you heard of that before, proprioceptive? Yes, so, uh, so I'll be very quick. So it's the idea of knowing where your body is in space without having to look at it. So the idea that you can be sitting, but you're not looking at your feet because you might be afraid that you're going to fall. The idea that you could be in the subway, but you don't have to put your foot on someone else because you already know where your body is. It, that's just unconscious knowledge. But with some of the children, that's not there. They, they have to lean onto people, um, lean onto furniture, um, push against you and other people that you don't know. Um, so the proprioceptive system. Uh, is, is one that, that we like to work with a lot and try to affect the change in that. Okay, so we all have sensory preferences. You know, some of you may like your coffee strong or loud music or whatever it may be, um, but when is it a problem? So I think this is important to, to know. It's a problem when your sensory processing does not let you participate in your daily activities. So it's a problem when you go to a mall and your child will not go into the public washroom because they can't handle the, um, you know, the toilets, the uh, automatic toilets, or um, they can't handle the sounds of the dryers. It's a problem when your child is in school and they won't touch the paint, so they're not able to participate in crafts activities. It's, so it's a problem when it affects your development, that's one, and when it affects your ability to participate in everyday functioning, okay? So that's when um, you need to figure out, okay, this is beyond a preference. This is beyond uh, something that she just, or he just likes to do. And this is, uh, I'm just gonna give you a, sort of a quick rundown of, of course, everything that we do is, comes from an evidence-based research. So we have theories and uh, a body of research that tells us where does the child's behavior fall into? And we have three different types of sensory processing 
We call them differences in Canada. Uh, we, don't, we don't call them disorders, so this, your sensory processing um, differences. So it could be a sensory-based motor disorder, it could be a sensory discrimination disorder or difference, or what uh, we most often see is sensory modulation issues. So the idea that your, your reaction does not match the input, right? So you're overreacting to sensations or not reacting enough, so you're not feeling pain or you don't know when you need to go to the bathroom or you're just seeking sensations, but they don't match up. So there's a modulation issue there. And that's what I'm going to be talking to you about. So we have three different clusters um, that we, mode of, we most often see, and this is um, the one that's most common. So it's called sensory over-responsivity or sensory avoiders. I'm sure we've, uh, so kids who cover their ears with sounds, uh, kids who can't wear clothing, underwear, kids who um, they can't touch, uh, they're on their tiptoes because they can't manage grass, uh, it's endless, right? So you get, you get my drift. So it's just, there's a lot of sensory over-responders. Um, so some of these children are passive, so they cover their ears and they just walk away. Some of these children are, they become overwhelmed and they become aggressive, or I like to say forceful, you know? So, you know, you get too close to me, I see that as a threat and I'm going to hit you. But it's not out of maliciousness, it's out of the fact that the sensory input was too much for them, okay? And in terms of their behavior, they're often very cautious. They're very cautious about where they're going. They have difficulties with transitions. They need a lot of preparation. Does this ring a bell? With, yeah, yeah, so sensory over -responded. And I, when I talk to the children, you know, I like to do a lot of self-awareness. It's not just the parents, it's the children. So I, I may say, you know, you're like Piglet in Winnie the Pooh. Like, it's, everything is a bit too much. So what can we do to help you, okay? Um, next, ha, ah, sensory seekers. So I see a lot of uh, sensory seekers in uh, our clinic. And these are the kids who are constantly moving. Um, they like crashing, bumping. Uh, they, when they're playing in the playground, they, hit, they take high risk. They like to jump from high spaces. Um, they may chew on things, lick on things. Uh, so they're seeking uh, constant sensory input. And in terms of their behavior, what I often find is that they're excessively affectionate. So they climb on top of you. They hug you, but it's not a hug, it's a lockdown. It's, um, you know, they, they get their face quite close to you and they push against you. Uh, it's, you know, <laughs> parents always tell me, it's like, you're coming out of a wrestling match, right? Like, it's <laughs> so it's like, whoa, okay. Um, so the force, the, the input uh, to, uh, to you um, is quite strong. And in terms of their behavior, they can become quite, um, we use the word explosive, right? So you're fine one second and then you explode. And, and so it's, it's very hard. There's no like escalating behaviors. You know, it's an explosive type of reaction when you tell them to stop. Okay, so of course, you know, it would be great if each child would fall into whatever category they would fall into, but that's not often the case. So you may have, a sensory seeker who likes to push against other people, and a sensory responder at the same time, a sensory under responder at the same time, right? So, so they all kind of mesh in together, and, uh, and that's, that's a real challenge to tease out um, uh, the different sensory profiles that your child may have. Um, okay. Okay, sensory under responders, right. Um, so these kids are the ones that are mostly on the floor. They like to lay down a lot um, or on the stairs. Not sure, what, they just, they're constantly sort of lying down. They, um, they're not feeling the sensations as much. So hunger, hot, 
going to the bathroom, like they, they don't get those sensations as quickly as others. Um, they, so they have passive behaviors. They're, they're usually sort of, they're not uh, difficult to deal with. Uh, they tend to be quite passive, often in their own world, uh, not noticing when other people sort of come into the room. And in terms of their behavior, they're slow to respond, they're quiet, they're withdrawn, okay? So those are your ears of the world. But remember, most often kids have um, at least two, at least two different types mixed in together, okay? All right, so what to do about it? And, and this is where, um, it's, it's the use of the sensory diet. And what's a sensory diet? So it's like, a nutritional diet that you give food to, you know, three times a day and different snacks. A sensory diet is where you're giving three or four main sensory meals, and then you have little sensory snacks throughout the day. And the goal is to help you manage your day to help prevent explosiveness or tantruming or, or overwhelm behavior, okay? And so the sensory diet, uh, just to give you a definition, it provides the necessary combination of sensory input to feed or nourish a person's nervous system. And I like this one. Uh, we are what we eat and we live what we sense. By controlling that what we take in through our senses, we, we can influence how we feel, what we think, and how we behave. Okay, so that's a, a sensory diet. So why do we provide it? The idea is to reach the just right state so for an under-responder, you want to bring up their alertness. For an over-responder and a sensory seeker, you want to bring them down to an actual balance um, uh, state, okay, state of alertness. Um, it's, it's good for you to understand that the behaviors that take place, they're not meant to be uh, mean or malicious, that they're seeking something because they need that input, okay? So even for parents and others to understand the reason why a child is behave, behaving in a certain way. And of course, to improve your child's quality of life and to help your child participate in daily activities, okay? So that's why we provide a sensory diet. So what is it? What, how do we do it? So it, it's made up of four parts. And uh, so there are sensory-based activities I'm going to tell you about. Uh, changing the environment that your child is in and, and, and making some small changes, your approach to the child, and also building in awareness training for the child, to, for them to start to understand and gain an understanding of why it is that they behave in a certain way. Okay, so there we go. So sensory-based activities that you can put in, they could be calming, organizing, or alerting. Okay, so in terms of common activities, there's lots. I'm just giving you some ideas for you to think about. So massage, we know it's calming. Um, the idea of the, the child sort of uh, a quiet hideout. So the child sort of seeking a space within your living space where they can kind of hide and kind of, you know, um, get away from the sensory input. So some parents have maybe like a little tent, or you could think about uh, what we call womb spaces. So some, a little space under a table or somewhere in your space where the child can go in and, and, and you can say, you know, if you need a chill out break, you can go there, you can go to your hideout, right? Um, snuggling, so I love beanbag chairs because the child can sit there and you can also sort of uh, squeeze them into it, right? So you can play games with the beanbag chair. Children like to sit in those because they provide full body pressure. Um, blanket wrapping, what I mean by this is, is uh, uh, wrapping the child up like in a burrito and then you let them go. <laughs> but the tightness of the blanket, and this is always supervised, you know, you're, you're playing with them and getting, giving them that input of pressure and then letting them go as a game. Um, what else? Slow rocking, so if you have a rocking chair, try it. Slow swinging. Um, I love Ikea, they have lots of like swing type things that you can use within your home. Uh, swinging and spinning can be, uh, children can find them very calming as well. 
um, lycra or spandex clothing. So the idea of providing pressure through clothing. So uh, smaller swimming shirts, trying them on. Uh, tights, wearing tights in the winter, wearing tights under your, your um, winter gear. Uh, and, you, and you see this, some of the kids actually, they, they want heavy stuff on them. They want the heavy winter jackets and, and they, want, they don't want to take it off, right? Like when it comes to spring, there's something to this. They, they want some compression. So, so, you know, maybe playing around with some of the clothing. And then weighted tools. I know there was a question about blankets, vest, lap pads, lap snakes. Um, how am I doing for time? Sorry. Seven minutes, okay. So um, the idea of using weighted stuff, but again, I don't want you to spend a lot of money, but it's just really the idea of maybe getting the child to pick up something heavy and take it to the car. So you make that transition easier, okay? Because you're giving them pressure as you're making that transition. Um, we talk about heavy work activities. So I think about giving your child more opportunities for pulling, pushing, lifting so and, and again you can this is endless you know getting them to push furniture getting them to do a tug of war with you um, getting them to um, uh, uh, pick up again heavier objects so like the laundry baskets think about household chores that if your child is able to do you can kind of trick them into doing and giving them a positive sensory input as well uh, pushing uh, things in a wagon and if you're going to think about um, sports, think about individual things that they can do that provide deep pressure sensory input, like trampolining, like karate, like climbing a wall. Um, so those are the things that you, know, you might as well, if you're going to do an activity, take swimming, take them to those that already provide um, heavy work input. Um, I talked about chair or wall push-ups. So that's when you go to a wall and you push or animal walk, so you hold their legs and they're walking like a bear and jumping on a trampoline. Uh, so some ideas for you there. And then for your sensory and the responders, kids who are often lost in their own world, you want to wake them up. You want to do some spinning. You want to bouncing on your lap, on the ball, on a trampoline. Um, again, bike riding. Uh, you can do things through the mouth, like chewing on ice chips or uh, sour candy. So again, just bring up their alertness so they can better pay attention to you. Uh, cold water play, musical toys, and cause and effect toys. So we want to give them sensory input so then you can get the best um, relationship and participation from them. Uh, okay, approach. Um, I want to talk to you first about um, sensory changes that you can make in your environment. Um, so things like having the beanbag chair, uh, thinking about um, like maybe like fidget toys, things that you can give to your child at specific times. So if they're always touching something, you can say, okay, look, there's your toolbox with different things that you can touch. And look, there's your timer. You get five minutes to to be with your sensory box, okay? But you always sort of do it in an organized manner. So, and you always wanna do sensory activities before difficult transitions, before difficult days, or before, you know, always make sure that you prepare them for, for that change. Um, and what I mean by approach. Approach is your interaction style with your child. So, coming down to, their level. So many of us don't do that, me included with my own children. Bending down to their level. Um, the fact that maybe talking a bit slower uh, or if your child is an under responder, talking a bit faster because then that's going to, you're using yourself. We call it therapeutic use of self. You're using yourself as a way for your child to change their um, alertness arousal levels. Um, and what I mean by awareness of your own values, I see this a lot in feeding. So we grow up with, you know, you have to eat everything on your, on your plate, um, don't waste food. Um, you know, there's a lot of, of value, Latin language around feeding. But you have to think about the children that have sensory issues, eating is a very difficult thing. Um, so maybe the fact that they're just 
they are able to tolerate the, the chicken on their plate. But even if they don't eat it, or you know, it's there, they're not throwing it away, or maybe they can touch it with a finger or with a fork, or, and then eventually, after many exposures, eventually they will eat that food. So that's what I mean by awareness of your own values. Remember that when you have sensory issues, um, they're not misbehaving. They're just having a lot of trouble um, managing that sensory input. Um, awareness training, and I, I talk about this, there's an article that I wrote for Autism Speaks, but I talk about awareness training there that you can refer to later, but it's really about uh, helping the child gain an awareness of, of are they sensory seekers? Are you a tigger? Are you a bunny? Is your car, um, are you too, what do we call it? We call it, you know, um, you need more gas or, or we have to get rid of some of the gas of the car. Um, so how is your engine working? We talk a lot about things that kids like to give them a sense of awareness. We're also looking at the idea of like videotape, you know, using your phone and, and maybe videotaping your child and you and your child can, you can then show your child um, the behavior and say, okay, what do you think other people, you know, and have a conversation, build some awareness about whatever the behavior that they're exhibiting is. Um, and again, that's, whole, that's a whole treatment piece, but I, I just want you to make you aware of, of, of doing a bit of, of that. Um, like things like visual stories I love, like social stories, the idea of using pictures to help your child. You know, when I go to a birthday party, it's going to be loud. When it gets loud, this is what I can do. And then there's tools that they can choose from, okay? So that's awareness training. I've given you some resources and websites. Um, I love the, web, the website Autism Speaks because there's an actual um, thing that's called like parents ask questions and there's <laughs> such good questions and people are responding to those questions. So take a look at that. And I think uh, even if your child doesn't have autism, I think the behavioral um, ways to manage some of these behaviors are good for all of the, um, the disorders. And then I gave you a website for some tools that you can get, that you can get like the weighted stuff if you're interested in trying it out and some books, um, and uh, this quote that I, that, I, that I think is exactly what a sensory diet is. So growth is a process of experimentation, a series of trials, errors, and occasional victories. The failed experiments are as much a part of the process as the experiments that work, okay? And of course, my favorite, Calvin, sensory seeker. So, you know, the bell goes, and what did she say? I can't even, I, God, I'm getting old. Didn't you hear the bell? Recess is over, it's time to go in. I'm not done yet. It takes me more than one recess to wear myself into a state of submission. <laughs> so thank you, thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it, thank you. Yeah, I think if you go to uh, the Autism Speaks website, I th there's a lot of behaviors. Like I, in one of my articles, I talk about like a, a child, um, well, a teen who is actually like snorting all of a sudden, snorting, and and so I talk about how to manage that behavior. And you know, there's other uh, questions about uh, teens who overeat, um, overeat, right? Overeat, right? I, like, and, and there's a whole, um, and I think Selena's here, but it's, there's a whole sort of, it's just for parents, yeah, right? It's like, a, it, there's a whole questions and answers, and I find that really helpful, even with the, uh, the young people that I work with.